the man credited with introducing Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger to BYD stock over a decade ago has just sold a significant portion of his shares. Lee Lu of Himalaya Capital, the man poised to replace Warren Buffett as head of Berkshire Hathaway, just sold $310 million US dollars worth of BYD shares. Now, who is Lee Lu and why did he sell those shares? Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. Great to have you here. If you're new, welcome. Make sure you remember to subscribe. Otherwise, you won't get notifications in your feed for all our future videos. And if you're not, welcome back. Great to see you again. Now, Li Lu of Himalaya Capital, one of the most successful hedge funds over the last 20 years in the entire world, and the founder of Himalaya Capital, has just sold $310 million US dollars worth of BYD shares. Now, Li introduced BYD to Buffet's Berkshire Hathaway, and he's trimmed his stake in the company to 6%, while Buffett and Munger have stayed the course with their investment in BYD not selling even a single dollar since their original investment more than a decade ago. And like I said, Li Lu is set to become head of Berkshire Hathaway. He's basically been announced as the next man to take over after Warren Buffett either leaves or dies. Whichever comes first relinquishes his head position of the fund. So who is Li Lu and why is it that he will be the next man directing the world's largest investment firm, the world's largest and the world's most successful investment firm. Well, Li Lu is a Chinese-born American investor and hedge fund manager. He's the founder and the chairman of Himalaya Capital Management, and he was one of the student leaders of the 1989 Tiananmen Square student protests, an experience he talked about in his book in 1990 called Moving the Mountain, My Life in China, which was the basis of a documentary film by Michael Apted. Now, Lu was born and he grew up in Tangshan, China. And honestly, considering his life's experiences, it's a true miracle that he isn't dead. The fact that he's alive to this day, and not only alive, but that he's become one of the greatest hedge fund managers, one of the greatest investors in history, is truly remarkable. What a story. I don't know if I've read this amazing of a story in the last few years. Just learning about him really was quite a fun adventure. Now, Lou was a survivor of two great disasters, really. The first of those was the Tangshan earthquake in 1976. Now, the Tangshan earthquake was an enormous earthquake that actually killed more than 242,000 people. It was known as the Great Tangshan Earthquake, and it was a natural disaster resulting from a magnitude 7.5 earthquake that hit around the region of Tangshan Hebei in the People's Republic of China on 20th of July 1976 at 3.40 a.m. in the morning. The maximum intensity of the earthquake was 11 or extreme on the Merkel scale. In minutes, 85% of the buildings in Tangshan collapsed or were unusable. 85%. All services failed and most of the highway and railway bridges collapsed or were seriously damaged. At least 242,000 people died. Now, some sources have said that up to a million people have died. And we know that China likes to revise their figures downwards, so it's very possible that up to a million people died in this earthquake. Now, even if only 242,000 people died in this earthquake, this would be the third or possibly the second deadliest earthquake in recorded history. Now, you can imagine just how insanely deadly this earthquake was when you realize the fact that more than 100 people died in Beijing which was 100 miles away from the epicenter of the earthquake. 100 miles away from the epicenter. Now, according to author Stephen Spignisi, a couple of days after the quake, Dr. Pabarasis Karianis gave United Press International an estimate of 700,000 to 750,000 deaths based on a similar-sized earthquake in Shamsi province in 1556 that caused 830,000 deaths. Now, there's been official reports that Apparently, the death toll was revised later to 275,000, which means more than half of the city died. Somehow, Li Lu escaped death, and his next brush with death came in 1989 at the Tiananmen Square protests. 
and the Tiananmen Square protests, known as the June 4th incident in China, have been completely hidden from the Chinese people. Not many people know about it there because they've been kind of removed from the internet in China, which is disappointing and sad. I don't think that's necessary, but that's what's happened. Now, the protests were student-led demonstrations held in Tiananmen Square, Beijing, during 1989. In what is known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre, the protests started on April 15 and were forcibly suppressed on June 4 when the government declared martial law and sent the People's Liberation Army to occupy parts of central Beijing. Now, estimates of the death toll vary from several hundred to several thousand. The Red Cross says more than 2,000 people were killed and 10,000 people were wounded. The protests were precipitated by the death of pro-reform communist General Secretary Hu Yaobang in April 1989 and the backdrop of rapid economic development and social change in post-Mao China, reflecting anxieties among the people and political elite about the company's future. Now, the reforms of the 1980s had led to a nascent market economy that benefited some people but seriously disadvantaged others, a little bit like Russia. And the one-party political system also faced a challenge to its legitimacy. Common grievances at the time included inflation, corruption, limited preparedness of graduates for the new economy, and restrictions on political participation. Now, although they were highly organized, now although they were highly disorganized and their goals varied, the students called for greater accountability, constitutional due process, democracy, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech. Now, obviously. The PRC couldn't have that. They wanted to hold on to power at all costs, which they've continued to do since. Now, around about two years ago, the Chinese Defence Minister, Wei Benghei, said that the state's bloody crackdown on protesters around Beijing's Tiananmen Square 30 years ago was the correct policy, that's what he said, because the country has been stable since then. So in his mind, the only way to make the country stable was to walk in there massacre thousands of people, and basically get everyone to shut up and toe the party line. Otherwise, we'll shoot you too. Interesting strategy. Obviously, for some reason, he still thinks it was the right one. Now, Mr. Wei made those comments at Singapore's Shangri-La Dialogue, an annual Asian Security Defense Summit, after a belligerent speech about Chinese sovereignty and international security. He claims that China's development since 1989 proves that the government's actions were justified. Well, fortunately for Li Lu, he wasn't one of the ones killed and he managed to get away with his life. In fact, right before the shootings, he actually married his girlfriend, Zhao Ming, at the Heroes Monument at Tiananmen Square on May 22. Now, it was a symbolic marriage that didn't actually have any wedding suites or any wine or any special things like that that you would come to associate with a normal wedding but it had bread and salt water. Now, Zhang Boli prepared a marriage certificate and embossed it with the stamp of the hunger strike headquarters, making it absolutely official. It was also Chai Ling's and Feng Kong's first wedding anniversary. Now, students gathered at the wedding to congratulate the married couple and sang the wedding march, which gradually turned into the international. In the documentary, Moving the Mountain, Li is shown to peck Chai on the cheek during his marriage ceremony. The peck and ceremony were emblematic as they sought to remove traditional restrictions on courtship practices and celebrate love as liberating. Many people who attended the wedding found the joyous moment to be a symbol of hope and happiness. Their marriage was seen as a light backdrop to the movement. Lee referred to it as, as marriage on the execution ground. Toward the end of his memoir, Moving the Mountain, Lee does not mention his married life after the crackdown on June 4. And there's since been no reports on Zhao Ming. So who knows? Maybe she was killed. I don't know what happened to her after. It doesn't appear as though anyone knows what happened to her. Now, during this period of time, Lu went to Nanjing University. He majored in physics, but he later transferred to economics. And interestingly, even, he even helped organize the students and participated in the hunger strike. So he wasn't just someone who was there. He was a key organizer of the entire event. So after Tiananmen Square, he decided he'd had enough of China and he went to study at Columbia University. He graduated soon after 
and was one of the first in Colombia's history to receive three degrees simultaneously, a BA in economics, an MBA, and a JD in 1996. Now, Lee was inspired by Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway to get into investing. And obviously, Buffett was a Columbia, Columbia alumnus, so he'd heard all about him, and he saw him give a lecture at Columbia in 1993. Now, after graduation, he founded Himalaya Capital Management, known for its disciplined and value-oriented approach to investing, very similar to Berkshire Hathaway. Now, from 1998 to 2004, he managed both a hedge fund and a venture capital fund. His fund suffered a 19% loss in 1998 from the Asian financial crisis. In late 2004, he transformed the hedge fund into a long-only investment vehicle, LL Investment Partners LP, which is currently focused on global investment opportunities. As far as I can tell, guys, the fund has actually returned over 30% every year, 20 straight years. Incredible. Now, Charlie Munger, Vice Chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and a longtime partner of the legendary investor Warren Buffett, is one of the investors of his fund, and he is a mentor and good friend to Lee Lu. Now, Lee Lu has been known as the man who introduced the Chinese battery and automaker BYD Company to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. He is an informal advisor to BYD, which makes his whole story even more interesting. He's an informal advisor to the company that he just sold, 350 million US dollars worth of stock. Now, his LL investment partners owned around 2.5% of BYD, and they now own 2%. Now, if you're wondering, well, Himalaya Capital Management, can I invest in them? No, you can't. Private hedge fund that you can't invest in, you've got to have a lot of money to knock on their door and ask to be a part of the fund. Now, since 2015, when the fund managed $2.4 billion, it has increased its holdings under management to $18.6 billion, eight times more than what the company was holding only six years ago. I'll repeat that. 2015, they held 2.4 billion in funds, and they now hold 18.6 billion. So if you're wondering what Himalaya Capital Management is invested in, well, obviously they own 2% of BYD, but it's not one of their five largest holdings. Their five largest holdings are, number one, Micron Technology Inc. The company owns 11.5 million shares in Micron, and it makes up 47.5% of Himalaya Capital Management's funds. Second place, Bank of America Corp, BAC, which makes up 21% of the company's holdings. In third place is Facebook, makes up 14.5% of the company's holdings. Fourth place is Alphabet Inc, or Google, which makes up 8.3% of Himalaya's holdings. And in fifth place is Apple Inc, which makes up just under 6% of Himalaya Capital Management's holdings. So Micron Technology 1, number 2, Bank of America, number 3, Facebook, number 4, Alphabet, and number 5, Apple. Now, Lee Lu's mantra is accurate and complete information, including understanding the character of a CEO by visiting his local church and speaking to his neighbors. Interesting. Now, the firm at one point managed the money of Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, and still manages some of his money. Now, Lee, like I said, is said to be the front runner to manage a large portion, if not all, of Berkshire Hathaway's investment portfolio once Warren Buffett steps down. According to the Wall Street Journal, Charlie Munger once said, it is a foregone decision that Lee Lu will be going to become a member of Berkshire's top investors team after Warren Buffett retires, if not the head. Now, this has also been hinted at several times during conversations with Buffett. Now, showing just how close Lee Lu and Charlie Munger are, in May 2010, Li Lu helped to translate and publish the Chinese version of Poor Charlie's Almanac, The Wit and Wisdom of Charles T. Munger in China, and he wrote a foreword for the book. Now, if you're not too sure who BYD are, well, they're a pioneering battery manufacturer in China and one of the country's earliest EV makers. They do also make petrol and diesel vehicles and hybrids. However, 70% of their current sales of car vehicles and trucks and buses, etc., are electric. Now, China is the world's biggest EV market, 
with sales projected to more than double to 3.5 million units in 2024 from 1.7 million this year, according to IHS Marquis. Now, not many people know this, but BYD used to refuse to sell batteries to other companies, but they've since reversed their decision and started cooperation relationships with various companies to gain a piece of China's fast-growing EV market. Companies that they're currently JVing with, joining up with, to provide them with not only batteries, but entire car platforms are Mercedes, Toyota, and there are a number of other JVs. Now, I've since I've recently reported on this channel before about the incredible price that BYD is able to sell their EVs for in China. They sell a, an EV, full EV, mid-sized SUV, for just over 10,000 US dollars. How they do that, I don't know. But obviously, BYD is a vertically integrated company and one that I am personally invested in. Now, BYD had a 12.9% share of China's new energy vehicle market last year, trailing the 14.7% share held by SAIC GM Wuling, but ahead of Tesla's 12.4% share, according to data from the China Association of Automobile Manufacturers. So, why did Li Lu sell about 20% of his stake in BYD? Well, recently, BYD announced that it was planning to spin off and list its semiconductor subsidiary on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, after which its share price actually jumped by 29% in June. Now, raising funds for its chip unit should directly benefit BYD. BYD Semiconductor is one of only a few companies worldwide and the only Chinese company that can independently produce insulated gate bipolar transistors, which are key components for reducing power loss and improving reliability in EVs. Now, aside from this news, BYD's EV sales have been climbing enormously this year. They're up about 200% versus the same time last year. So the company as a whole appears to be doing very well. It's poised to expand into global markets, has a number of JVs in a number of different countries, and many contracts with other car manufacturers and car distributors. So it's possible that this recent spin-off has had an effect on Lilu's perception of BYD. However, it's important to remember Berkshire Hathaway have not sold any of their position in BYD. So let's look at a bit of the recent history between Himalaya and Berkshire Hathaway and see how they've kind of copied each other over the last 12 months. Not just over the last 12 months, of course, but also previously with their purchase of BYD. It was reported by Markets Business Insider that Charlie Munger's Daily Journal invested in Alibaba in the first quarter of 2021. Now, a fund manager dubbed the Chinese Warren Buffett by Charlie Munger may have prompted this surprising move. Munger, best known as Warren Buffett's right hand man and Berkshire Hathaway's vice chairman, has also served as Daily Journal's chairman since 1977. The newspaper added 165,000 American depository shares in ADS in Alibaba to its stock portfolio in the first quarter. Its stake was worth $37 million US dollars on March 31, making the Chinese e-commerce group its third biggest holding after Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Now, Li Lu, the founder and chairman of Himalaya Capital Management, potentially recommended Alibaba to Munga. The pair are close friends, and Li introduced Munga to BYD, the Chinese electric car company that has been one of Berkshire's best investments over the past 20 years. Now, Lu has bet on Alibaba before, and currently Himalaya owns 175,000 Alibaba ADSs worth 34 million, and Munga clearly values Li's opinion. He complimented the Himalaya chief's intelligence, energy, patience, strategic aggression, and ability to weather losses at the Daily Journal shareholder meeting in 2018. Moreover, he entrusted Lee with a chunk of his fortune. I've given Munger money to some outsider to run once in 95 years, Munger said at the Daily Journal meeting in 2019. That's Lee Lu. And of course, he's hit it out of the park. So Munger admitted the only person he's ever let handle any of his own money was Lee Lu. Now at the time, Munger also described Lee as the Chinese Warren Buffett during that meeting and lauded him for focusing on Chinese stocks instead of the oversaturated American market. Li Lu just went where the fishing was good and the rest of us are like 
cod fishermen who are trying to catch cod where the fish have been fished out, he said. Munger went as far as telling the Wall Street Journal in 2010 that it was a foregone conclusion that Lee would become one of Berkshire's investment bosses in the future. Now, the really surprising thing about this is that Munger doesn't like Jack Ma. And who is the CEO of Alibaba? Jack Ma. Munger expressed skepticism towards Alibaba at the Daily Journal meeting in 2019, saying that he knew little about them and he was suspicious of manufactured investment products that are aggressively promoted. Moreover, Munger criticized Alibaba's co-founder during the latest Daily Journal meeting in February, despite investing in the online retailer that same quarter. He said, Jack Ma was very arrogant to be telling the Chinese government how dumb they were and how stupid their policies were and so forth, he said. Considering their system, that is not what he should have been doing. Munger offered an explanation for the Alibaba wager in a statement to Barron's. Daily Journal wanted to hold cash equivalents and treasury bills were yielding too little, he said, so the company turned to common stocks. And then Munger expressed optimism about Alibaba's long-term prospects. So clearly, Lee may also be getting stock tips from Munger. Himalaya added a new 100 million stake in Apple. It's since dramatically increased from that size. Berkshire's biggest position so far in the fourth quarter of 2020. And it also reported Bank of America, Daily Journal's largest position and Bank of America's second largest as its number two holding. So Berkshire and Himalaya are to some degree mirroring each other. As I just mentioned, Apple and Bank of America are two of Berkshire's largest holdings. And it's the same for Berkshire Hathaway, right? In addition to that, Himalaya owns a significant percentage. In fact, it's the second largest holder outside of personal hold, holdings by the founders of the company in the world of BYD. And of course, Berkshire is the first largest holder of the stock. So you can see they're mirroring each other. So what my thoughts are, if Berkshire sell part of their position in BYD, over the coming months, to mirror the sale made by Lee Lu of BYD, then we need to start asking serious questions about what's going on. At this point, I own stock of BYD and I have no plans to sell them. However, I'm going to be very interested and pay close attention to what Berkshire and Himalaya do over the coming months when it comes to BYD stock. And I'll keep you notified on what happens. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.